Well, good evening and welcome to class session three in our course, The Christian Worldview. This is one of our Flame Alive classes that are uh, designed to keep the flame of Christian truth alive in the life of our church. And we're glad that you're with us and we welcome both those of you in, in the room and those who are joining us by live stream this evening as well. Uh, class three, the first night we gave an overview to what worldviews are and how Christianity is in worldview. The last week we tried to look at God as ultimate reality from the Christian perspective. God is the, the defined reality of ultimate reality and why that matters. And, uh, and that is the foundation upon which the uh, worldview of the faith is actually built. And everything spins off of that, and I, I think you'll see that as we move along uh, together. Uh, tonight we're going to look at the idea of truth. Uh, what do uh, worldviews say about truth? Uh, what do they assert about truth? And how does the Christian faith address the whole issue of, of truth? So we'll, uh, as always, we are establishing a framework for a further investigation in each of these categories. We're not intending to uh, answer every question or even to uh, scratch every itch that may be felt in these uh, ideas, but rather we're designing a categorical framework for understanding how things fit together in a Christian worldview. So that's that's what we're trying to do. That's why we're here tonight. And I'd like to lead us in a word of prayer. So would you join me, please? Heavenly Father, it is clearly a time in which we live where um, truth is being lost at a rapid clip. Just the very idea uh, that there is a truth and what that truth is and how we come to understand it. And uh, I would pray that you would bless this evening as, uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we try to uh, put down an anchor uh, for further investigation uh, in Bible study and, and uh, growth as to how the Christian faith looks at the concept of truth and presents truth uh, to people. We pray that you will bless our time together and help us to hear and understand that we might apply. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, we have a number of uh, particular points that we want to think about together as we work our way through this. I I would, if you have a title for tonight's uh, talk, it would be Truth and Revelation uh, in Christian Worldview Thinking. The truth and revelation, those are the two things that are in view for us tonight. Let's first of all think about worldviews in general and how worldviews think about the concept of, of truth. All worldviews insist that there is a truth to know and that people can know that truth and they they purport to present a means by which uh, people can engage that truth all worldviews say that uh, even atheistic now we addressed uh, atheistic worldview thinking last week in the context of ultimate reality and I want to I want to say something similar to what I said last week 
even if a worldview claims to be atheistic, uh, that is, they don't believe in God, yet as a worldview, they will claim to present truth that they believe exists and how one can know that truth within the context of their worldview. Every worldview tries to do that, whether they say it or not. Therefore, worldviews in worldview thinking, one is taught what there is to know from their perspective and what one may know about what is there is to know and how one may know it. By the way, how one knows what there is to know is called the study of epistemology. And that's E-P-I-S-T-E-M-O-L-O-G-Y, epistemology. This is the study of what do we know and how do we know what we know. To what degree do we know that which is knowable? And we'll be thinking together about that as well tonight. Not just what is knowable, but how do we know what we know? Now let me add to this talk about how worldviews think about the whole concept of truth. Let me add to that the idea of revelation of truth. Because this adds to the concept of whether or not there is a truth, but how is truth revealed? Or how is it knowable? Every worldview will claim that truth uh, can, that they uh, teach can be known and is known to certain people in certain ways. This implies revelation and an engagement of that truth in some way that fits our human experience and capability. So that this type of thinking describes the way that truth is knowable and how we can know the truth in terms of the worldview that we embrace. So with all of that in mind, let me punctuate four key components to worldview thinking as it pertains to truth and revelation. Number one, worldviews assert that truth is knowable. By the way, let me pause and say, there are worldviews who claim there is no truth. But the way they think about that means that they believe that their assurance of non-truth is a truthful statement. So there, it's ludicrous. It's, 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 you cannot say there is no truth because in saying that, you're claiming to make a truthful statement. So that in and of itself is truth. That is why postmodern thought could not survive because it is ludicrous. Back to my point. Every worldview will assert that there is truth and it's knowable. Number two, they will assert that humans are knowing beings. That there's a sense in which humans can know that which is knowable. Now, granted, uh, they will, depending on the worldview that you're studying, they will indicate what is, what is knowable and how one may know it. Uh, usually, they would give guidance as to what, how we know that which is right and that which is true. But all worldviews will assert that humans can know and should know what there is to know as governed by that worldview. Number three, there are epistemological contexts and limitations pertaining to the knowing of truth. I think every worldview will, will teach that, that there are epistemological limitations. That's, that's governing the limits by which we can know what is knowable. Uh, I don't know, well, very few. 
most of the time, a worldview that you bump into uh, will assert that there are some who know and some who don't know, and those who know don't know all there is to know. Even Christianity asserts that. That we can know the truth, but in knowing the truth, we don't know everything there is to know about the truth, which we know. And we, we believe that as well. That's what growing in the knowledge of Christ is all about. And I believe, although it's not within view, well, it is a little bit in view of our talk here tonight, but I believe that the Bible teaches that when we go to glory in heaven, that we will continue to know in ways we don't know here, and we will grow in that knowledge. Those are epistemological limitations that are inherent with our knowing. And number four, first is truth is knowable. Two, humans are knowing beings. Three, their epistemological context and limitations to knowing that which is knowable. Four, there is significance to knowing. It matters whether or not you know. Um, I once read about a group, I think they were active in the early 20th century. They weren't very big and they didn't go very far, but they were called the know-nothings uh, in this group. And they claimed to know nothing and I see why they didn't go very far. <laughs> Usually a worldview will assert it's important to know what they believe you should know about that which is knowable. So there's significance to knowing. Certainly the Christian faith asserts that as well. So all of these things are inherent within worldview thinking in general as it relates to truth and how that truth is revealed. Now let me talk to you about Christianity. And I just want to make a, a couple or two or three general statements about Christianity as a worldview uh, pertaining to the nature of truth itself. Christianity teaches and confesses that not only is there truth, but that truth by its very nature is absolute and eternal. That truth, capital, and when, when we talk about truth, we're not talking about uh, relative truth, that is a truth a slice of, of ultimate truth that we can truly know in a material time and space framework, but rather what is truth of very truth? So I usually use the term capital T, truth. That is the truth out of which all truth comes. Um, that truth, Christianity asserts, is absolute and eternal. It is perfect. It is not changeable. It doesn't improve. It doesn't grow. It is the very essence of who God is. So that one may say, God is truth. In fact, Jesus, did he not say of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's a very remarkable statement. I am the truth. And yet, we would believe that that is what truth is. That truth, being truth, must be absolute and eternal. And being absolute and eternal and perfect must be at the very essence of who God is. Thus, there is no truth but God's truth. Second, Christianity asserts that this truth is good and loving. And I will always connect the words good and loving. The way I theologically define a love in a scriptural sense is that it is, um, it, it is the essential uh, fabric and essence of sovereign, eternal, divine goodness. So they go together. Uh, to be good is to be loving. To be loving is to be good. God cannot be non-loving, nor can he be non-good. He is both because they go together. And that is true of truth. Truth, and it's interesting when you go to 1 Corinthians 13, I 
quoted verses or I referred to verses 1, 2, and 3 in my sermon today. But if you get down to what, verse 4 through verse 8, where Paul describes love is, love is, love is, and you walk through those characteristics of love, and it is true to say Paul didn't define love, he characterized love, which in fact defines what love is. But you will note that Paul makes it clear that love and truth go together. You cannot have love without truth, and you cannot have truth without love. Thus, all of that is bound together, according to Christian thinking and the teaching of Scripture, in this whole concept of goodness and love. Truth, goodness, and love go together. And thirdly, now these are just general concepts that relate to Christian's view, Christianity's view of truth itself. Truth is at the very heart of a relationship with God. Now, we haven't talked about the relationship with God. We'll scratch this more when we talk about, one night we'll talk about sin, and one night we'll talk about redemption, and one night we'll talk about humanity. But, but when, you, when you talk about these things uh, that all are housed in the gospel, you, you must think of those issues uh, as they relate to a relationship to God. Uh, when God created humanity, God created Adam, and then later Eve. But in creating, creating Adam and Eve in his image, he created by necessity of their essence of human existence to be in relationship with him. Now, this is in a pre-fallen state. And it's unique to Adam and Eve that no other human after them could ever experience. Uh, but there's relationship. And when you get to redemption, redemption establishes a relationship with God between the sinner who is saved and the Lord God himself. What I'm saying here regarding truth is this, that in that relationship with God, which is uh, certainly an essential part of redemption, that connects... Uh, inevitably, with the whole idea of the nature and role of truth in terms of human experience. Meaning, you can't have salvation without truth. And to have truth and to know God truly means one comes to know the truth that is truth about God himself. And it's interesting, Jesus in John 17 in the early part of his high priestly prayer, says in verse 3 that to, to have life means to come to know God. So this knowledge, this relationship of God with God uh, is part of what it means to be saved in a saving relationship with God. And Peter in 2 Peter 1 talks about the seed of the truth, the word of God, that bore the fruit of being born again in our hearts. So there's a connection. Be, and you can just see, I think, if not, it's okay, I'll help you later. But you you just begin to see the applications of this in terms of preaching and teaching and evangelism of the role of truth in helping people to come to know God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's Christianity's general uh, belief relative to the nature of truth itself. Now I'm going to give you about nine different points relative to the revelation of truth. And, and again, we've been talking tonight about both truth and how it's revealed. As we think about Christian thought regarding truth, Christianity insists that truth is a revelation from God to humans. That for humans to know truth, this is not essentially a discoverable issue. That's not to say we shouldn't study truth. But for us to know truth, God must reveal that truth to us. 
Now certainly that is true as it relates to sinners. Sinners cannot come to know the truth of the gospel unless God reveals that truth to them. And we'll, we could talk a lot about that. He has to take the scales off of our eyes and we go, I get it. Well, how does that happen? It happens by God's grace, by God's spirit. But, but I would argue that um, even in Adam's relationship to God, Adam's knowledge of truth was by revelation from God to him. Now, there's a difference. In Adam's case, it was non-mediated truth. So God spoke directly to Adam because there was no sin to hinder them, right? Uh, it's an interesting study to think about uh, the nature of created humanity in a pre-fallen state. And, uh, and yet it's never been that way since Genesis 3 and sin. But in redemption, we're brought back to a relationship and the knowledge of God in a, in a way that even Adam didn't have. But that is another interesting study as well. The point being, I want to talk about the revelation of truth as it pertains to Christian worldview thinking. Nine points. Number one, Christianity argues that eternal truth is knowable in its very nature. It's knowable. Now, <clears throat> let's be clear. Christianity does not teach that people can know truth on their own. But that truth itself, by its very nature, is knowable to humanity. And that's different. Um, I would connect the nature of the knowability of truth with the very goodness of God. I would argue that God, by virtue of being a good God, he cannot be anything but good because he, he is God, out of the fact that he is good, drives him to reveal himself truly to human nature which was created to know him and enjoy him. So that God cannot not reveal himself. So revelation of truth is a necessity of being because of the reality of truth, the reality of God, and what humanity is taught or created to be. So truth is knowable by its very nature. Thus, that would lead me to argue that it must be known by humans. It not only can be known, it must be known. There is a necessity to know. And, and I think we sense this in our humanity. We want to know. We are curious creatures. We want to know what we don't know and what we think is significant to know. And we are driven to know. By the way, that gets us in trouble. Eve got in trouble for wanting to know what she shouldn't have known. And that, that drove her to sin. But that's another issue altogether. Certainly there was a curiosity to know within her. And I think that's part of her humanity. As we have already said, God thus is known by the truth. And truth is a means of knowing God. Truth can be known and surely is known in the human mind and in human experience. And together, this forms the essential uh, aspect of actualized humanity. Now, I said a lot in that statement. Let me narrow the focus of it. Here, I'm indicating that the knowability of eternal truth indicates that we have a mind to know, and it is through the mind we must know that which God would have us to know. Meaning, we don't bypass the mind to know. Now, the mind is not the only component. 
you add into that experience. So there's experience that works with the knowing of the mind that together when we know and experience truth as God reveals it to us, this actualizes or, if you prefer, fulfills or completes our humanity. God made us to know. And to know it involves both intellectual and experiential aspects. You see a lot of this coming out in redemption and salvation. Um, I do want to point out, there are those who will argue, I have a friend, I had a friend, I guess we're still friends, um, years, years ago, and she wrongly believed that God, and she told me she believed this, which um, we had to have a discussion about this. She said, God bypasses the mind and goes to the soul. That is, that is not true. What she was believing is experience is a total means by which we come to know truth. That is not taught in Scripture. Now, there is a spiritual dimension to knowing, but it does not bypass the mind. In fact, the mind is the gateway through which truth goes to the soul. Thus, the scripture says, we are in the process of renewing our mind. So, all of that Christianity says relative to the knowable nature of eternal truth. Number two, God, Christianity argues, is the source of truth. Finally, a simple statement. God is the source of truth. Where does truth come from? Truth comes from God. There is no truth that doesn't come from God. Because God is truth. And God is the one who gives truth through His revelation. And to know Him is to know truth. So there is no truth but truth that comes from God. Number three. God, in being truth and revealing truth, reveals himself truly in truth. God reveals himself in truth. God's revealed truth, when we come to understand what it is, we first must understand this is a self-revelation of God. So he is revealing himself to those to whom he reveals his truth. And in that, we surely need to understand that he is revealing all aspects of himself, which I will limit to include the following. His goodness and morality. Morality is nothing more than a codified understanding of the goodness of God. The law of God is the revelation of God of his goodness. These are not random or arbitrary laws. When you read the moral law of God, both in the Old and New Testaments, you are reading laws that reflect the goodness of God. And so to break those laws, those moral laws as taught in the Bible, you're actually violating the holy nature of who God is. And thus it's a rejection of God himself. It also reveals his justice and righteousness, which is connected to uh, his moral being. And he reveals his personal essence, both in his communicable and incommunicable attributes. God reveals himself when he truly reveals his truth to us. Number four, God brings people, Christianity argues, God brings people to know him through truth, through knowing His truth. Now, we've already talked about this tonight. Let me just add to what we've already said a few more remarks. This means that truth is a means by which sinners truly come to know about God. You cannot come to know about God outside of God's truth, which He reveals 
And we're going to argue in a little bit that this truth is found in Scripture and in Scripture alone. So you cannot know him outside of his truth, which he revealed in, in Scripture. As he reveals himself to people and brings people to know him through the truth, certainly in the gospel of Jesus Christ, this establishes true knowledge of the true God, which is essential to live a truly human life. Uh, when we get to humanity, I will argue vociferously that sinners are not, I'll say it like this, but I'll need to explain it, I guess. They're not truly human as God intended humans to be. They are human in that they're created by God in the image of God, but that image is marred in sin. So that we could say, really we need to say, that the only true human after Adam was Jesus Christ. Once Adam fell into sin, the only truly human, the only human to live humanity as God created humanity to be is the Lord Jesus Christ in His incarnation. But we are recreated in that, in redemption and salvation so that we are living a portion of that reality of humanity which God created. And one day, in glory, we will be absolutely human in every way God created humanity to be. That's an exciting part of our thinking relative to eschatological thought and the promises of the gospel. Number five. Christianity teaches that truth has coherence. Coherence. What do we mean by coherence? We mean uh, at least two things. We mean it's logical and it's rationally integrated. So truth, being truth, is coherently logical. Christianity is not against rational thought. Christianity insists that Christian truth is the only truth that makes rational sense. So much so that to depart from truth is irrational. A lot of people will say Christianity uh, just, uh, just leaps in faith. All it has to do is say it leaps in faith. And what they mean by that is that Christianity believes we believe things that we come to believe in the dark. But that's not true. We come to believe things because they're in the light. We have come to know these things as the revealed truths of God in His Word. And these truths are integrated logically so that they fit perfectly together like a logical puzzle. And to remove one is to destroy the picture that the puzzle makes. So Christianity isn't something that you can pick and choose what you like. <laughs> I like this, I like this, I like this. But I don't want to deal with these other things, Christianity. No, it all goes together. That's what makes it a worldview. It's coherent. It is true to say that truth is segmented into different categories, but these categories are compatible. And they are consistent with each other. And furthermore, all truth links together in the center of truth, which is God himself. God is the hub. And all truth relates to each other as it all truths relate to each other as they relate to capital T truth in God. This is, this is coherent. This is rational. This intellectually makes sense. Number six. Now, number six and seven and eight and nine are going to talk about revelation specifically. The re revelation of uh, truth. Number six, general revelation. 
And then number seven will be special revelation. And I'll put these two together. First general and then special revelation. We're talking about God's revealing truth. General revelation means what it seems to indicate, that God is revealing and has revealed truth in a general sense, which gives you the idea that th this is a broad stroke. It gives indication, but not specific precision, and that's right. There are two aspects to general revelation. That is to say, God reveals generally about himself and about ultimate reality. One, he reveals generally in creation. Creation is God's general revelation about himself. The psalmist will say, the firmament shouts and speaks of God uh, from day to day. They cry out. There is no place where their voice is not heard. It's talking about the stars. Uh, Paul, in Romans 1, talking about the essence of sin, says that sin is about people rejecting the general revelation that they have in creation. And it's interesting that having rejected what God reveals in creation, then they create idolatry of creation. They make idols of four-legged creatures and animals. And you see that. Idols are made of animals and insects and snakes. And, and yet, all of these things were created to speak about God to us in symmetry. And by the way, here's where I would put the study of aesthetics. A-E-S-T-H-E-S-T-I-C-S. Aesthetics. The study of aesthetics is the study of the beauty and the harmony and the symmetry and the glory of all that God created. I love to see some of you when you post uh, photos of a sunset. And you'll, uh, you'll see that someone will go, oh, what a sunset. And they'll take a picture and post it on Facebook or something. And that always gives me a thrill because... You're enjoying God when you do that. God created that. Creation is meant to tell us God is there. The other general component is conscience, human conscience. Every human is pre-loaded uh, with the software or the package of conscience. Now, conscience can be seared. Conscience can be deadened. Conscience can be calloused. And indeed it is in sin, as the New Testament argues. But again, Paul says in Romans 1, that because they rejected what they knew about God in creation. So they had an inner witness within themselves of what they saw in creation. And yet they rejected both creation and their inner witness as it proclaimed God to them. And because of that, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. They became hardened. They became immoral. They became wicked because they rejected general revelation. And that's why every person in the whole world is a sinner. Because every human being has conscience and creation. And number seven, special revelation is the Bible. And we talk about this a lot around here, and well, we should. <clears throat> there is only one special revelation, and that is the Bible. Uh, now, again, I just want to touch on the fact um, that there were days, there were times in human experience before Christ, in which God spoke in various ways. Hebrews 1-2 says, in times past, God spoke in various ways. Dreams, visions, uh, theophanies, 
theosphaneo, God appearances. Uh, and that would be temporary appearances of God in the Old Testament for specific reasons. Uh, but Hebrews 1 also says God doesn't do that anymore. That's why we, Christianity, I think Christianity as Christianity argues that the Bible itself is the only post-incarnational revelation of God throughout history as long as it remains. God will not speak in dreams. He can. He will not speak in visions. He can. He, cannot, he will not speak in theophanies. He can, but he won't because he has spoken to us in Christ and he speaks to us of Christ in Scripture. So I want to press that point just a little bit with you. This is the special... Christianity argues, I know there are groups of churches and denominations who don't agree with that. I am arguing then they are aberrant in their views of those things and they're not Christian in that area. They're inconsistent in their Christianity because Christianity argues that Christ is the final word and what we know about him is found in the Bible, particularly in the New Testament. So, thus the scripture and the scripture alone, and I mean Old and New Testaments, the 60 six books of the Bible, is the precise and specific revelation of God concerning all important aspects about which Christian worldview thinking speaks. About God, about humanity, about sin, about right, about wrong, about Christ and redemption. And we'll scratch this in this course. Okay, special revelation the Bible. Number eight, the Bible as revelation is in human language. In human language. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about this. I think this is very, very important. I do want to say that what when we say human language, we are talking about human language that can be known. We are not talking about language that is impossible to interpret. But it's human language that follows uh, the rules of grammar and syntax. Human language. The Bible as revelation is given in human language. God has spoken in subject Verb, direct object, indirect object, qualifying words, phrases, and clauses, paragraphs, and books. God wants us to receive His Word, which is given to us in language. Why? Because human language is the perfect conveyance of ideas and thoughts including eternal thoughts. Now, that means um, language is superior as a conveyance of ideas to visualizations. Um, again, let's talk about a sunset. We can enjoy a sunset. We can enjoy the colors of a sunset. We will be inspired by a sunset, and we can think, Glorious thoughts about the God who created that sunset, but a sunset will not tell you his name. A sunset will not tell you whether he is righteous. I mean, I suppose you could argue, which I think aesthetics does, that beauty argues for goodness. <laughs> but that's another issue. You need precise revelation, which is what is human Language. Language carries the weightiness of concepts and enables us to study truth in a repeated fashion with objectivity and understanding. 
Now, I will put an asterisk here and mark that, yes, God has revealed specifically and specially His revelation of precision, of, of truth in human language in the Bible. But in order to grasp and understand the Bible, Christianity asserts, and, um, and I will just insert that here, that it takes more than a trained mind to understand the Bible. It takes an enlightened mind and a saved heart. Uh, just a passage that you need to think about that. 1 Corinthians 2 verses 12 through 14 will talk about the carnal man cannot understand the things of God and the spiritual man does. The distinction there is between unsaved and saved people. Saved people are enlightened, and that's the word we use to discuss um, the ability that spiritual saved people have to understand a special revealed truth of God in the word. Uh, or we use the word illumination, which God the Holy Spirit gives us as we are interpreting the subject, verb, direct object. So there's a spiritual dynamic. But the spiritual dynamic does not bypass the study of grammar. Because human language is the conveyance by which God has revealed his truth. Number nine. Still talking about Christianity's assertion regarding revelation of truth. Christianity argues that God's revealed truth is both progressive and redemptive. And here's what I mean by that. Here's what Christianity means, means by that. It is progressive in that it starts general in the Old Testament with visions and dreams and theophanies, and then it narrows the scope. When you, when you read the Old Testament, you begin to realize that there is a general sense of revealed truth that relates to God's redemptive covenant promise concerning the Messiah. And as history progresses along, so does revelation and prophecy in the writings of the Old Testament. The scope is narrowed. Uh, God chooses a man, Abraham, uh, who develops a family and then tribes and then a nation to whom he gives the law. And from the law, he develops a kingdom. God is narrowing the scope of revelation concerning his redemption that will be and was fulfilled in Christ. So revelation itself is progressive and redemptive in nature, fulfilled in Christ and the New Testament concerning Christ. Number, you know, I told you I had nine points. I have ten. Number ten, concerning the revelation of truth. Really, we've already... Uh, hinted at this strongly, and that is divine revelation as it pertains to the incarnation of Christ. I just m indicated this in my previous statement. Jesus Christ is the incarnate Son of God. He is God the Son who became man, and in coming to earth as the God-man, he was the pinnacle of God's revelation. And he fulfilled the prophecy of the one who was to come. Thus he is himself the Messiah. Salvation is found only in him. And he is the king of God's kingdom. Redemption is fulfilled in the salvation of sinners. Only in him. The revealed truth of God. Finds its apex in Jesus Christ alone. Now all of those ten points. You will find. I believe. Consistently taught. In Christianity. As it asserts truth. And how it is revealed. In human experience. Now I want to bring up a few more. 
categories before we close tonight. I want to talk now about what Christianity says relative to human epistemology. That is to say, how humans know anything, to what degree we know anything, and why it is significant to know what is knowable in truth. Christianity asserts that humans are different than any other uh, life form that God created in creation. Humans were made in the image of God, which has profound implications regarding our human epistemology. I've already indicated there's a difference between pre-fallen humanity in knowingness and what we know and what we can know now. However, redemption is a restoring of our ability to know what we are given in our capacity to know as humans. That is to say this, as humans we are given in our humanness the capacity to know that which we don't know because we're fallen in sin. But in salvation, that knowingness, that capacity is actualized or the ability to know is restored, which was in our capacity to know. Thus, it is not too far to say Christians know what lost people don't know. Because our knowing ability has been restored. Not only is our ability re restored, but our desire to know is restored. We want to know the truth. We no longer want to rebel against God in what we know. But we want to know what He wants us to know. And this capacity is fulfilled in our salvation in a limited sense on earth. But when we get to glory, it will be fulfilled in an absolute sense to the degree our humanity can know. Thus, regeneration and redemption has such an impact on our epistemology that it boggles the mind and causes us to praise God. We are restored in our knowingness of God in relationship and what we can know about God. And this is significant. Why is this significant? Why is it significant to know what we can know and ought to know? Christianity argues that knowing the truth of God brings us to know God himself, which fulfills our joy. You cannot have joy without God. And to know God is to know the joy we have in Him. Thus, enjoying God is the great gift we are given through knowing God through His truth and by His grace. And as such, we can live for God. We live for Him in the context of knowing Him, which we are given when we are brought to Christ. Let me just... Uh, close with a couple of things relative to Satan's hindrances of knowing and how we should defend uh, the truth that we might present the truth to others in our Christian lives and work. Thus, I think we can easily see why Satan wants to hinder the truth of God. Every attack Satan has ever made even from the Garden of Eden, has been on God's revealed truth. When he tempted Eve, he said, has God said? And he wanted to cast doubt on what God said. From the very beginning, uh, even when he tempted Jesus, he misused a verse in the Psalms. He is always attacking the Scripture Beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, everything Satan wishes to accomplish begins with an attack on the truth of God in Scripture. He does this because he's attacking God himself. 
when you attack God's word, you're attacking God. Paul will argue in 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is God breathed. God's word is God's breath. It's his power. It's his creative power. It's his restoring, revealing power. God hates or Satan hates God and he hates God's word. He attacks God's integrity and authority and his honor. Thus, he attacks the word of God. He hates the gospel, so he attacks the word of God. He attacks the kingdom. He hates the kingdom, so he attacks the word of God. He attacks truth. He attacks goodness. He hates people. He does not want people to come to know the truth of God because in coming to know the truth of God, they might come to know God himself. Thus, that leads us to consider how we must commit ourselves as Christians to defend and maintain the truth of God. I don't think it's any stretch to say if Satan wants above all to destroy the truth, surely we must say above all we must defend the truth. We must bring the Bible to people. We must teach the Bible to people. We must interpret the Bible to for, for folks and help them learn to interpret it. We must train the people how to rightly understand the word of God. We must present Christ and the gospel in the context of the script, scriptural truth. This is the challenge that we have today. And I think it's true of every age in Christian history. The challenge is to preserve the truth of God that we might present that truth to people. There are various ways that the truth of God uh, is attacked. There are those who argue against the very existence of transcendence, that truth itself does not exist. Some cast doubt on the integrity of the scripture. We even find this in seminaries and Bible colleges, tragically. We find this in pulpits where pastors throw doubt on the sufficiency of the Word of God and the reliability of the Word of God. I want to warn you that some of the greatest proponents uh, for Satan's attack on the Bible can be found in churches. It's not just outside, it's inside. And we must be wise and discerning and perceptive. Perhaps one of the greatest threats to the truth of God in churches is the neglect of the truth itself by pastors and Sunday school teachers and those who claim to be doing God's work and yet they never present the truth of the Bible to people. So in closing tonight, I just want to summarize what our faith indicates regarding truth and how it's revealed and why it's so important to get this right. You will find all the way through the Bible from creation where God spoke and things were to the New Testament where the word of God is presented as, as the very core issue of everything God is doing on this earth, we find the word of God prominently presented as truth. Christianity cannot lose its understanding of the truth of God or we're losing a fundamental component to our Christian faith itself. We thank you for being here tonight and we pray that God will use this in our thinking as we continue our Christian journey together. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we would pray tonight that you would put within every believer's heart a passion for the Bible, for the Word of God, the Scripture, and not substitute anything for it, but to give ourselves for the, to the study of it and to the proclamation of it, the preservation of it, 
the defense of it and the maintaining of it. Lord, we would pray that you would use us, use our church, and we pray that you would grant us the privilege of standing with you in defending your truth in this generation. Raise up a mighty generation of people who will stand with us in this glorious task in these days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.